Venkat Subramaniam, who will talk about functional programming, technical reasons to adapt. Thank you, thank you very much. It's great pleasure to talk about something that is exciting, something that people have been talking about. It's it's pretty amazing time uh, if you really think about it. Uh, almost every single mainstream language now has a way to do functional style of programming. So the question is, why? Why should we really care about uh, functional programming? What's the reason for it? And if you really look around, there is quite a few interesting things that have happened over the past, well, maybe about 10 or so years. One is the growth of computer applications. You can think about big data and frequent data, large volume of data. It's pretty amazing how the world around us has changed quite a bit. But most of us in this room would totally agree. One of the things that we fight with almost constantly every day is accidental complexity versus inherent complexity. Inherent complexity is the complexity within the application. Accidental complexity is what we cause to it. We create through the solutions we are implementing, we cause the accidental complexity. If there's a way that we can remove accidental complexity, then we can tackle inherent complexity would be much better way off, and we can see some of the ways in which we can avoid that. Now, there's also one other big problem. The problem is, with object-oriented programming, we have really objects, but over time, it's turned into polluting objects with state. Now, if you really think about it, what's, what's wrong with state? Well, if you think about creating an object with a state, and then you call methods, and then it modifies the state of the object, if all that is done in, uh, in, a, in a private, basically, in other words, you are keeping it to one single thread, that's not such a big deal. Have we ever done mutability? Absolutely, we have done mutability every time we write code in one of these languages. So mutability is not really that bad. What about sharing? Well, remember what mom told us, right? Sharing is a good thing. So sharing is good, mutability is all right, but shared mutability is devil's work. And the minute we bring in shared mutability, all kinds of problems creep in. And it turns out functional programming has a way to handle that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But then again, there's something else that happened. About 2003 time frame, an engineer walked up to his boss and he said, you know, it ran really fast before it melted. And they realized that they couldn't really put more into a core. They had to go to multi-core processors. Now, unfortunately, though, with a single processor, multi-threading is about more or less multitasking. With multi-core processor, the threads are running all the time in steroids, and we have to make sure we don't run into each other. And it turns out that most of the languages that have been in use really don't provide a good way to handle these concurrency issues. So the first question is, what's wrong with mutable state? Well, the first problem with mutable state is, the more mutability we have, the more error we have in code. Now, if you are going to be writing a function, and within the function, you are receiving some variables and you start modifying variables, the chances are you're causing more errors in code. I remember one day a, a programmer calls me and says, here's a function I wrote, and I can't really figure out why this produces the wrong result. Can you please help me? And I look at his code, and we both are reading the code, and about 10 minutes later, we both look like fools because I'm saying, if you give this input, it should produce this output. And he's like, yeah, correct, but it produces this, do you know why? And we keep going over this, and eventually, we start stepping through every line of code, and exactly on line number seven, he is taking the input parameter and modifying it. And as soon as I said, are you really modifying the input parameter, immediately says, oh gosh, I know what the problem is, thanks for your help, and walks away. So the point really is, we are complete denial that we would actually modify an input given to us, and yet we do this, right? So more mutability there is in code, there's more errors. How many of you, how many of you in this room can juggle Raise your hand if you can juggle. There's two people in this room who can juggle. Oh, three, OK. Uh, four, OK. I was reluctantly raising the hand, right? Because he was busy juggling. So the point really is, we don't really do well in juggling. There's a reason why very few of us can do it. Why? Because it sucks. Right? It's really hard to concentrate. It's hard to really focus on what you do. And mutating variables is like juggling. right? So 
We really don't, we're not good at it as human beings. We're very creative, but we're not good, good at this. And it is also very hard to reason the code. How do you explain a piece of code to somebody? And as you're trying to explain the code, I'm sure everybody in this room has done this uh, at some point, right? You got a function that's mutating a lot of variables. After a while, what do you do? You take a piece of paper and start writing the variable names, and then you are trying to put the value, and you strike the value, put a new value. Ever done that before? That's the lowest point of programming, right? Because you know this has become way too complex and you can't handle this anymore, right? That becomes really hard. And also, it's very difficult in several other ways. This reminds me of an experience that I had. This was way back years ago. There was an application we were porting from one platform to another. This was a C++ application, has been in production for years, and, and our job was to take this and port exactly, no added functionality. This should run here on this other new platform. So, you know, remember how they tell you that C++ is portable? Have you ever heard that? That's the biggest lie, right? So we take this code, and we are running it, uh, supposed to run it on the, another platform. Well, the code compiles, and that's when the real fun starts. You know that, right? So this programmer we had runs the application. This is a huge, complex application. And he finds that there is a problem in the seventh decimal place. I mean, if you ask me, I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. But unfortunately, this required a quite, quite a bit of accuracy. And so he's, he was in office for several days trying to figure out, and eventually he finds the problem code. And once he found the problem code, the next morning, he calls everybody into the office, and, and we're around the table, and he says, I want to know who wrote this code. And you can see that he's very angry. He's going to kill somebody. We knew that, right? And the code he was showing to us was something like this. It was something like A++ plus B plus C plus A++ plus plus plus, and then it was going like this, <laughs> right? And, and he shows this, and he says, do you know who wrote this? And I, I, you think anybody's going to admit? And the guy who wrote it is like, let me leave the building before he looks in the source control system, right? <laughs> and, and so as we were looking at it, then he goes on to say, he opens up Bjorn Stostrup's book, right? The programming uh, C++ book. He opens it, highlights a paragraph, and says, read this. And everybody's like nervously reading it. And on that paragraph, Bjorn Stostrup says, don't do this, right? And, and why does he say don't do this? Because he says, well, the compiler can have the leverage to interpret this one way or the other, and as a result, one compiler may interpret this as run in one sequence, another may interpret it as another sequence, so when it compiles the code down, it may not produce the same result, and exactly that's what happened. But what's really wrong with this code? The wrong, what's wrong with this code is mutability not done once, but done several times over. And so it becomes really hard to reason this code, even for compiler writers. And then, of course, it's very hard to make code concurrent. Now, if you have a variable and you have loops running, and somebody says, make this code concurrent, how do you make this code concurrent, really? Can you just throw threads at it, be done with it? Absolutely not, right? Remember your, your experience? You were working on a single threaded code application. Everybody was smiling at each other at work. Every morning, you would go to work, and people would actually look at you and say, hello. And then one day, they said, we got to have speed so let's go multi-threading. And then what did you do? You started using threads, and then what happened? The code quietly turned into a monster, right? And nobody wants to look at the code or look at each other anymore. And while you are struggling with this code, there is bugs all over. You couldn't manage this at all. You're working night and day, and you are tired. So what did you do? You decided to apply for the other job. That's called concurrency, right? <laughs> while you're fixing the problem, right? So, so, no, 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 we don't want to do that, right? That's really hard. So, mutability makes it extremely hard to make code concurrent. So, all that said, what is really functional programming? Well, anytime somebody tells me functional programming, I always wonder, what about the rest of us? Are we dysfunctional programmers? Anyway, the point is that there are functional programming and people write, write, write functional code. But this is actually very, very old. So I'm going to have a little question for you. Just throw numbers. Don't worry about being wrong. That's perfectly OK to be wrong. Do you remember what year uh, object-oriented programming was introduced? Just throw a number. 1967. Two Norwegians, uh, 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 um, Nygaard and Dahl, created in 1967. What year do you think object oriented programming became like popular? Nobody ever questioned, and they started doing it. 89, 87, 89 time frame. If you really look at it, what is that? That's 23 years. 
Can you imagine that? If Obi was a human, it had a neglected childhood, right? And then when it was 22, they said, hey, handsome, right? So it is really a long period. Now that's 22 years. Can you believe it? When somebody comes to me and says, oh, programming, things change really fast. I look at them and say, what are you smoking, right? <laughs> that's 22 years, right? Anyway, leave that aside. What year do you think object-oriented programming became, sorry, functional programming became mainstream? Trick question, not yet. Got right. <laughs> do you remember what year functional programming was introduced? 1950s Lisp, right? Do you know what year these concepts were introduced? Not, oh, 1889 or 1989? Okay, well, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of Alan Turing, right? Everybody has heard that name, absolutely. This is Alan Turing's professor, Alonzo Church, and this was back in 1929. And they were like, this was before computers as we know it, right? And they were interested in knowing, is it even possible to compute stuff? They were worried about computability and the halting problem. And then what did they do? They said, let's think of a function. And what would you call functions? Today, you'd call it x, y, and z. They, they were not very different. They call it lambda. And so lambda functions basically are functions, but these are functions that are anonymous, and we could pass them around. But what is really functional programming? It's been around for a long time, but one of the most fundamental things in uh, functional programming is the attack on the mutability, assignment-less programming. Now, if I tell you you can program with no assignments, you're probably going to say, this guy needs to be in asylum, right? How could you program with no assignments? That doesn't seem logical at all. But let's look at something else that's equivalent of this before we go any further. If I were to write Java code, for example, and if I were to say go to in Java code, right? Now, you would obviously say, oh, no, 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 you don't want to write go to. Because structured programming says we should not use go to. Why? Before structured programming, we were doing really code with a lot of different things where we called it spaghetti code, right? Well, that sounds really great, but once we start coding, it's not fun. So spaghetti code is where we can't quite find the logic where it is going, and suddenly it comes out of one function and says, hello. I'm just like, where did you end up right here? What's the context? And then, you know, mess results up. Well, so we said, no more go-tos for you. Well, good old Dijkstra, Edgar Dijkstra said, go-tos are evil, don't use it. In in fact, in Java, goto is a forbidden keyword. You cannot use goto. In fact, go ahead and try. Type a four-letter word and compile the code. Look at the error message. Type goto and compile it. It will scold you very differently if you use goto than if you typo with an another word. But having said that, let's look at something else a little bit. So if I say for, for example, int i equal to 0, i less than you know, five, for example, I plus plus. And if I were to simply say output I, very trivial code, very simple code, it's a for loop. However, if I go to the command prompt, I use Java P minus C, and I've already made minus C as the default. And if I ask for the sample class, so let's actually ask it for classes sample right now, and take a look at the bytecode that it generated for a second, and guess what you see in the bytecode? Go to rascals, right? Well, the beauty is, it is go to after all. Hey, but we can't use go to. That's the whole point. You don't want to be writing go to in your code, but that doesn't mean go to's never happen. In a way, it's like you don't give matches to kids, right? I mean, you don't go to the kids and say, here's the matches, play with the matches while I go shopping, right? You wouldn't do that at home. Does that mean there are no matches at home? Not really. You do have matches, and you use it in a controlled manner. Same thing with go to. There is go to, but we don't use it at our code level. Exactly the point. We don't have assignment doesn't mean there is no assignment. We don't do assignment in our code, but assignment happens under the hood in a controlled manner so that it can be done you know, for all the reasons we talked about to give, bring the benefit of immutability. So we have immutable state. What does it mean by immutable state? Let's take an uh, example here. If I were to take a, a, a denomination of currency, and if I give it to somebody and say, could you please, br please break it, what I really meant is I want change for it. Well, Dominic says, sure, and he tears it into two pieces and gives it to me. 
He looks like he can do it, but the point is that's not fun, that's not what I meant. So breaking the currency doesn't mean tearing it apart, but I want to see it disappear in his pocket, and then two new currencies come out. So we do object transformation rather than object mutation when it comes to functional programming. That is another thing we do quite a bit. But then we have what are called functions as first class citizens, and what does it really mean? Well, that means that we can pass functions to functions. We've been passing objects to functions. We've been creating objects within functions, and we've been returning objects from functions. Now we can pass functions to functions, create functions within functions, and return function from functions. And what does that really mean if, uh, if we can do that? Let me give you an example of this for a second. Uh, if I, you can look at this from the point of view of different languages, but I'm using Java here. Let's say thread, the thread equals new thread, and then I'm going to say in here thread.start, and I'm going to say in main for a minute. Now within this, I'm going to say new runnable, and then within this, I'm going to say public uh, void run, and then within the run method, I'm going to say uh, hello for a minute. So I run this code. You can see hello printed afterwards after in main was called because it's running in a separate thread. But I want you to ask those people who know Java, uh, uh, what is that called? Where is a new and an interface name? Anybody? It's an anonymous what? Anonymous inner class. Well, in Java, they call it anonymous inner class. In English, you call it missed opportunity. Because they had this for a long time coming, right? Now, what's wrong with this? What do you really, really want to send to thread? Honestly, what do you want to send to thread? Does the thread come to you and say, give me an object? No, the thread says, give me a function. Because you want to run a function in a separate thread. Does it make sense? But what did we go to tell the function? We told the function, no, sweetie, you cannot go alone. It is unsafe for you to be around here. So we will put you in an object, and the object is your caretaker. They will take you over there, right? And the poor functions have been, when will I ever grow up, right? <laughs> so that is exactly what's been happening here, right? So finally, finally, functions have grown up. It is mature, and you can see that I'm going to remove the ceremony in this code and just put a little arrow right here and remove this part right here, and you can see the code still works, but you can see the function finally say, yes, I can go alone on my own. I got my own driver's license, right? So the point is, functions are finally being treated with the respect they deserve. That's why it's called as functions as first class citizen. We can pass functions to functions rather than saying, no, 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 we cannot pass functions. You got to wrap them into objects and pass them around. We don't have to do that. In functional programming, for functions are first class citizen. We can pass functions, create functions, return functions the way we want to do it. That is one big benefit you see up here in terms of what they provide. And functions have no side effect. Now, what is a side effect? Side effect is where, when you call a function, it is not affected, and it doesn't affect anything outside of the function. So while the function is running, it doesn't affect anything outside, and it is not going to be affected by anything outside. This is one of the biggest benefits of uh, functions with no side effects. These functions are called pure functions. Now, what is actually a pure function? Um, so the idea behind a purity is that when you call a function, it doesn't modify anything outside and leave a mess. And as a result, there are several benefits to it. Let's talk about a pure function for a minute. Now, I was uh, traveling uh, uh, to India, and I landed about 2 AM. So after a very long flight, it's 2 in the night. What's the most logical thing to do? I said, it's nice time to write some code. So I took up my application. I had all the tests working. And so before I took the flight, all the tests was working. Now that I was in the hotel, I took my code. And I wanted to write some code. I said, the first logical thing is to make sure all the tests pass. So I run all my tests. And guess what? Several of my tests broke. I'm like, damn, these airlines do a lot of this stuff to code these days, right, as you travel. Well, it turned out the reason why the test failed is, which is a good news, I rarely work at 2 in the morning, but it, uh, it so happened that there are some tests that said, step back three hours and make sure the event is on the same day. 
Well, I was kind of silly writing this just in the first place, but the point is, at two in the morning, three hours before was not the same day, and my tests were failing, a lesson learned for me, but it also proves the point what happens when you have code that is a bit inconsistent. So to understand this, let's take an example. Who can volunteer here in the first row? I need one helper. Who wants to help? I'm safe. You, you, come on over, sir. Well, can, yeah, there's a microphone for you. There you go, thank you. Okay. And introduce yourself, what's your name? Uh, Michal. Uh, Michal? Michal. Michal. So I've got a little tough, tough task for you. Can you help me here? Okay. All right, so nervous? Good, uh, because I'm going to ask you some really hard math questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready? Oh, that's bad. What is two plus three? Five. He's pretty good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. What's 2 plus 5? 7. What is 2 plus 5? 7. Sorry, 2 plus 5? 7. He is pretty consistent too, <laughs> right? Well, now you know what a pure function is. A pure function gives you exactly the same result no matter how many times you ask, as long as the input and output are exactly the same. Let's try something else different. Just throw a number, don't have to be accurate about this. How much time do we have left before this talk is over? It's going minutes. to say way too long. 15 minutes. 50 minutes. Let's say I wait for a minute and ask you, how much time is left before this talk is over? About 15 minutes. About 15 minutes. After three hours, I ask you. No. <laughs> After 15 minutes, I ask you, what's the answer? It's different, right? Yeah. You're not going to be consistently the same time anymore. Why? Because now your computation depends on something external, which is changing. What is that? Uh, time. Time. Thanks for your help. Right? I didn't say you can use a lifeline. OK, so it's time. Now you get a picture of a nice thing about purity versus impure function. So what does a pure function do? Easy to test, isn't it? Because as long as you send the same input, you're going to get back the same output. That is one big benefit. But here are some other benefits. If you call a pure function, it gives you a result. There's something else you can do. So are you ready for my next challenge? What is 33 plus 42? Uh, 32. Uh, <laughs> 77? 77, you said? OK, let's assume it's 77. We'll do a unit testing on it. <laughs> so here's a question for you. What is 33 plus 42? Uh, 75. 75. What is 33 plus 42? 75. What is, was he quick this time? <laughs> Were you faster this time? This guy is smart. <laughs> what is 33 plus 42? <laughs> what is 33 plus 42? 75. 75. What is 33 plus 42? 75. This guy is really awesome. <laughs> What's he doing? Not only did he have cash value, did he notice his cash expired? <laughs> awesome. The point very well demonstrated. What, what did we do just now? <laughs> what did we learn? What we learned is the first time he did the real work. The second time, what did he do? He used a cache. Do you understand if I say use the cache? Yes, you do. That's why in computer science, we never use terms others understand. This is called memoization, because nobody knows what that means. So what is memoization? You cache the value, right? So in other words, if the computation is pure, you can use memoization. Meaning, hey, look, I did this computation just a while ago for the same set of input. It doesn't matter I go through and do this again because the result is going to be exactly the same. I might as well cache it. So a lot of functional programming languages give memoization as an already built-in function. And what's the benefit of um, memoization? There is another wonderful two terms called dynamic programming. I love, again, that because it's neither dynamic nor programming. But anyway, dynamic programming is a fantastic recursive algorithmic technique where they use recursion in excess. And the computational time here is exponential, but they do it linear time by memoization, as it nicely demonstrated. So by having pure functions, we can memoize and gain performance. This also, for 
falls into what's called referential transparency. Referential transparency is where you can replace a computation with the value of the computation very easily, and you can save performance. So a lot of optimization can happen. There's another big benefit related to referential transparency. Imagine I have two functions with me, function one and function two. Imagine I'm not using the result of one on the other. These are just two functions. I need the result of them later on. Now, this is function one, function two. And as a compiler, I decide to run function one and run function two in that sequence. But later on, I realize I could actually save a little bit by running function two first and then run function one. Now, if I want to really switch these two as a compiler, you realize I can only do this if these two functions were really pure, right? If the functions were not pure, when I call function one, it leaves residue behind, and when I call function two, it may rely on that value. Very dangerous to do the switching. Making sense? But if these two functions are pure, what happens? I can run function one and run function two after that, or I can run function two and run function one after that. The compiler can do this optimization, or a compiler which knows about the hardware, we call it JIT compiler, says, oh, wow, look at that. I do have multi-core processors. I'm going to run them concurrently at the same time. So the point is, when functions are pure, compilers can do optimization quite a bit. If the functions are impure, what do the compilers do? They put on a big pair of gloves. They treat it like the virus, right? It's like, don't go near that code. It's very smelly. Stay away from it. So compilers don't do optimization because the code is real. Uh, you know, pouring through all pores, if you will. So the point is, a lot of these compiler optimization can be used when the function is pure. That's one of the biggest benefits. So what are the benefits? The benefits are we can write code that is easy to understand, easy to modify, easy to reason, easy to work with, and you can rely upon better optimization at the compiler level, and we can also do a number of other optimizations, making the code concurrent, all of those become really powerful benefits. So we talked about functional style. There are some programming languages which are purely functional. Now, what are purely functional programming languages? They don't do any mutability. They don't allow any mutability at all. And of course, there are uh, the other functional languages, which are providing functional style, but permit mutability in a controlled manner, and we can pick and choose what may make sense depending on what we are doing. Well, my prediction is, with most of the mainstream languages now supporting functional style of programming, the world is going to have a lot more programmers using functional style of programming than using functional programming itself. So we better be ready for really good practices because it's a dangerous turf we are, are traveling. So given that, what does it really mean for a code to be in functional style? It is about function transformation, state transformation, rather than state mutation. So we have to think about a problem where we are transforming the state rather than sitting there and poking and modifying the state of the object over and over, and that is just a way to develop code. But what does it really mean to program in this style? Well, up to this point, we've been programming imperative style. Now we are beginning to program functional style. What does it really mean, in essence? Let's take a look at an example of this for a minute. Let's say for a minute we are having a list of integer values, so integer. And in this case, I want to take a number of values. Let's say the values are arrays dot as list. Let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now that I have these values, I want to double each of the values, and I want to total them. Now, how would I do this? I'm sure everybody in this room has written code like this, total equal to 0, and I want to output the total. But then you say for int i equal to 0, i less than numbers dot size, i plus plus, and then you say total plus equal to e times 2, and you run the computation for this particular value, i rather, and you're trying to find the total. Actually, it's not, right? You say numbers dot get i, even more fun, and you write the code to do the work like this. Anybody here who has written code like this? But the more important question, how do you feel <laughs> writing that code? You feel dirty. Seriously, don't you? If this is a code you write, you feel dirty. You go home in the night, and the kids come running towards you. You say, don't touch me. 
right? I've got to go shower first, right? That, don't you feel that way when you write code like this? That is called imperative code. So what is imperative code? It is very smelly, right? You go home and they look at you and say, where have you been, right? So it's even worse. Though anybody who works from home, yeah, you got about 10 seconds to close the monitor. Otherwise, the kids look at this and say, that's what you do for a living, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, right? They... <laughs> so that is, that is imperative code. Imperative code has two smells with it. The first smell is you got to tell it every step of the way, not only what to do, but how to do it. And then you see on line number uh, eight, we set total to zero, and what are we doing on line number 10? We are modifying this variable over and over and over. If I turn up the volume of my computer and run this code, you would literally hear the variable total say, ouch, 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 on line number 10, right? Because you're poking at it several times, right? It's like, leave me alone, right? So that is one big sign you see here. So you have to tell every step of the way, and plus you have to mutate it several times. Let's try this one more time. So we're going to say out. Put, and in this case, I'm going to say numbers dot, and I'm going to say stream, which is a fancy iterator, and then I'm going to say dot map, given an element, element times two, and then I can say sum, and this depends on the language, depending on the language you are using, and since I'm using Java here, I'm going to say uh, map to, let's say, int uh, over here, and ask him to map it to an integer, and you can see the result is exactly the same. However, look at the code below. You didn't go through a loop over and over and over. It just stacks up nicely. You said given a collection of numbers, double each of the values, and total, it begins to read more logically. It's very expressive. That's one big advantage. So what does that mean in terms of imperative versus this is called declarative style? In the top code, where you wrote the for loop, you had to do a lot of low-level stuff. That's sometimes called the primitive obsession. But the point really is, the top-level code, how, how does it feel? It feels like you're talking to a toddler, right? Those of us who have toddlers at home, a little kid, and you want to do something, the kid says, I want to do it. I want to get a glass of water. And what do you say immediately? Sweetie, walk very slowly. Look where you are going. Hold with both hands. Don't be smiling while you're doing this, right? You are giving so many instructions. The code below feels like you are talking to an adult. Well, knowing some adults I know, let me rephrase, it feels like you're talking to a responsible adult, right? So you can simply say, may I have a glass of water, please? And the next thing you know, you got a glass of water with you. So that is a big advantage in this case. The second thing is, did you notice in the code below, how many variables did we mutate ourselves? None. The code is humane. No variable was tortured in the making of the result in the bottom code, whereas in the top one, we poor total, don't talk about it, right? So the point really is, that's a big difference between imperative versus declarative style of coding. A declarative is more expressive. You tell what to do, you don't spend your time telling how to do it. You rely on the libraries to get the job done. As a result, you are more productive. Not all declarative code is functional, but all functional code is declarative. So you can be very expressive in writing code. And what's the benefit of being expressive in writing code? You actually get the code done, and you get to go home. How cool that is, right? So in other words, you don't have to stay at work writing stupid code, right? You can write the code, get it working, and you can go home. That's one big benefit that you get out of this. So the code is easy to understand, easy to work with, easy to reason. Now, we can do quite a few things. For example, if I want to find a person in a collection, how would we do it imperatively? We would say, take a collection of people. Take one person at a time. Check if their name is what you're looking for, how tedious that is. But it turns out there's another function you can call. You can just take the collection and say dot contains, and it's done, right? So that is declarative. You're using a library function to get the job done rather than writing all the code ourselves. But let's go further with this and see how we're going to do all of this. So double even values in a collection. So we already did double of the values. But how do I do a even values? I would say if numbers.get 
i mod 2, for example, mod 2 is equal to 0, then do the total, not otherwise. Make sense? But look at this code for a second. What did we do in this code? Initially, we used a for loop. Now what are we using? A for loop, right? With a little bit more in it, a if statement. Now, how does that feel? Imagine you hear a knock on the door. You go open the door, and there's a guy standing there. And you say, who are you? He says, I'm here to fix your kitchen. I got a call that you got a kitchen problem, so they hired me to fix it. You say, well, that's great, but what do you have with you? And he shows you the hammer. He says, that's all I need, ever. And whack, he takes and says, where's your kitchen? You're not going to be very comfortable, right? I call that the jack of all for loops. What do you do? For loop. How do you do this? For loop. What about something else? Another for loop. Kind of becomes scary, isn't it? This is called for monster, right? And it wants to do everything. Instead, we are saying, well, let's use little, little things. So what does a professional do? You hear a knock on the door. You say, hello, who are you? I'm here to fix your kitchen. And the guy has a nice little bag, walks over to the kitchen, lays it down, and puts the tools out. You say, are you going to use all of it? He says, no, not really. I'm going to find what your problem is, and then I'm going to use it. Makes sense, right? A person knows what the problem is using. If not, that's called a consultant, right? So anyways, so knows what the problem is and uses the appropriate tool. So basically the idea is you say, oh, I'm going to use this chisel or a little screwdriver, whatever it is. Well, we got these little tools to use. I always like to make fun of consultants because I'm one of them. OK, so in this case, I say filter given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0. And notice that in this particular case, we got exactly the same result. But notice what we did. Well, initially we used a map, now we use a filter. You can get the feel for these little tools to get the job done. And we can do nice filtering and mapping and transformations and things like that. So it becomes a lot more easier and logical to write this code, as you can see. So we saw how we can do this code in imperative style, but also in declarative style as well. And the functional style leads up towards that. So the differences are, we say how to do in imperative versus in here we say what to do. That's one big difference. In the case of the imperative style, we often mutate stuff. In the case of a decl uh, declarative and functional style, we transform. We have side effects in the case of imperative style. We write pure functions as much as we can. We pass objects in imperative style and object oriented programming. Here we can also pass functional, uh, functions as well. It is very hard to compose with imperative style, whereas functions nicely compose in the case of functional style. You can already see the composition right here. Take the collection, filter it, and then follow it with mapping, and then do another operation sum. You can see nicely flowing and composition nicely working in front of us. So we can program with higher order functions very easily. And so we can see how we can total values and do a lot of wonderful things. Let's understand this with an example of how we would go about doing these uh, things. Let's take an example here and work with it. Let's say you are at work on a Friday evening, and you have this excuse me, very important get together. You're going to meet some really good friends, and you're really excited. You've been talking about this for weeks, and it's that Friday night. Well, you're sitting at work, and your colleague comes to you and says, can you do me a favor? I need a function to total all the values. You look at your watch. You know what? There's enough time to get this work done and go to your a nice party. Yeah, I can get that done. So what do you do? You write this function called total values, right? So what are you going to do? Output total values, numbers, and to implement this, you're going to say public static int total values. We'll write it in imperative style because we don't have time. So what are we going to do here? We're going to say list of integer, we'll call it values, and int total is equal to 0. Obviously, I want to return the total when I am done over here. And then, of course, within this, we'll say for int element in values. And we will say total plus equal to element, and we can get that code to work. So you finish this and say, yep, it's done, it's checked in, and you are about ready to go. But as fate may have it, your colleague comes to you and says, can I ask you a favor, please? I need one more function from you. Uh, what is it that you need? Well, not only do I want total values, I definitely want that function. But in addition, I also want total even values. And the colleague walks away. You look at your watch, it's getting very late. Your party is, excitement is just you know, building. You want to go to this party, but 
your colleague who nags you wants this function. So what do you do? Well, you look around, and there is a really good news waiting for you. You have almost all the code you already need, right? This is fantastic. And, and you look at your watch and you tell yourselves, you know what? There has got to be a reason why they created copy and paste, right? I mean, think about it, right? If nobody should use it, would they ever create it, right? I mean, in fact, it's so cool. This is amazingly cool. I don't know if you know this, but it's so cool. All you do is control C and control V. How cool is that, right? So you can say total even values, and you simply say if the element mod 2 is equal to 0, then do the total. Isn't that beautiful? So you got that working really quickly, and you're all smile. You can go to your party. But unfortunately, your colleague comes in right away and says, dude, I need one more help from you. I want to compute total odd values. You're like, please, I got a party to go to. No, just do this and go. Now, you know one thing very clearly, right? Copying and pasting code a third time is an act of criminal negligence. <laughs> you know that you cannot do this. But it's Friday evening and nobody's looking, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you do this one more time, odd and not equal to, and you get that working, and guess what? Yes, it worked. And you quietly slip away, and you go to the parking lot, check in the code, and take off. Well, as you're driving, guilt eventually kicks in you realize that's not what you signed up for, right? You pull up by the nearest coffee shop, and you start refactoring it. But as fate, fat, uh, as fate may have it, some of your other geeky friends are hanging around in the coffee shop. They look at you and say, hey, what you doing here? And before you could close your laptop, they look at your code. They get to know your dark side. And this is really hard, right? Because they no longer want to return your phone calls. They don't want to hang out with you. I mean, who would hang out with people who do copying and pasting for a living, right? This can be life-changing, as you can see. So let's pretend this never happened. So let's roll back the code really quickly and quietly back off. And right there, we are sitting down, right? This is like, I wish life was like transactional, right? You can pretend this never happened. OK, so now what do you do? Your colleague comes over and says, hey, can you ask, can I ask you a favor? Can I have a function that will total all the even numbers? You say, well, yeah, I can do that. Now leave me alone. So what are you going to do? You're going to do a little refactoring. You're going to say, comma, given an element, return true. So notice we are passing a second parameter to this function right now, and the second parameter actually is a function. The first parameter was an object numbers, but the second one is a function that we are passing. And by passing this function, we can tell the object, here's the totaling I want you to do, but I'm going to tell you what to total in this particular case. So now I can go back here to this code, and I can say if selector.test to this particular object, if the selector is happy with this, sometimes, excuse me, people call this as predicate. You can call that predicate as well. But in fact, that's exactly what I want to use here. And different languages, again, provide different implementations for this. And I'm going to say predicate over here. So now I can go back to this code and say predicate integer. And I could simply say, in this case, I've got a, a, a selector, and we can pass the selector to it. Now you can see that it totaled all the values because a selector basically accepted every single value. Now that we refactored that code, now we can replace this with saying, given e where e mod 2 is equal to 0, I want to do the totaling, not otherwise. And of course, when your colleague comes in a few minutes and says, can I have another function, please? You say, no, go back to your desk and do it yourself because I wrote it in an extensible manner, and we can now total not only even values, but we can total odd values as well, or any value that you want to be a using a select or a predicate for. So now we can see how we did function decomposition and not just object decomposition. This is power to us if we do it rightly. We can enjoy object composition and function composition, and they can coexist if we do it in a good way. And that is another power to us by using this functional style of programming. And and it becomes a lot less code to write and easier to work with as well. And if you noticed, we eliminated the dry violation as well because we were duplicating the code earlier, but we don't have to do that here. So we can see how this leads to quite a bit of uh, greater good.
Now, given this, I want to distinguish between a few things here because you're probably going to come across this eventually. So let's talk about lambdas versus closure just for a second. If I were to go back to this code and do a simple printing of the value, if you will, so notice in this case I could say numbers dot for each, and in this case I'll say given an element, I want to output just the element itself. So this is an example of using a lambda. So where is the lambda here? Well, the highlighted code is the lambda. What does it mean it's a lambda? Well, it's an anonymous function. Now, remember, functions have four things, right? Function has a name. It has a parameter list, a return type, and a body. So name, parameter list, return type, and a body of these four things, which you think is the most important, the one you cannot live without? The body of the function, absolutely. So body of the function, where is it? Well, the body of the function is to the right of this arrow in this particular example. Different languages deal with this differently. You got to figure out the syntax for the language you're using. Usually, it's an arrow of some sort, either a two arrow and an angle, or one and angle. Or if you're a Ruby programmer, it's a vertical bar. So every language kind of figures its own syntax. But usually, that separator gives you the body of the code to the right of the separator almost always. And now that we saw that, to the left of the arrow is the parameter list. So we have the body of the function and the parameter list, two down. What about the return type? It infers it. Hey, what about the name? It's anonymous. Who cares what the name is when everything is done? So this is a lambda expression. It's an anonymous function. That's what we are passing. However, if I were to print not the element but twice the element, notice in this example we still have a lambda expression. However, I could write this a little differently. I could say e times factor, for example. Now, if you look at just the lambda expression that we have here, I could ask you what e is, and it's very clear what e is. And given this e on the function body on the right side, this e is nothing but the parameter being passed in, so that's pretty clear. But if I ask you what is this factor over here that we are seeing, and what's the answer, we don't know what this factor is right now. So in other words, this lambda expression is rather unsatisfied. It doesn't have the factor. It only has the element uh, parameter e that's coming in. So this lambda expression is going to go out looking for the factor, trying to find out where this factor is. And the immediate place where it looks for is in its own scope. It says, do I have this with me? In the highlighted part, it looks for factor. There is no factor, but it found e, but not factor. Then it goes to its defining context. That defining context, we'll say defining context, uh, defining context in this case is also called as lexical scoping. So what is lexical scope? Lexical scope is, it's a scope where the lambda is defined or in the scope of where the defining scope itself is. So for this example, the lexical scope are the function main itself, the static scope within sample, for example. And so those will be the lexical scope that it will go look for. And once it finds in a lexical scope, it can bind to it. So in this case, if I say factor equals 2, you can see that in this particular case, it bound to this factor from within this particular scope. If you really think about it a little bit more, this actually is pretty fascinating. So example in this case is you are in main. Think of that as level one in the stack. You call the function for each. Now you're in level two of the stack. From there, you come into this anonymous function. You are in the level three of the stack. From the level three of the stack, it reaches over and accesses the factor from the first level here, isn't it? That's lexical scoping, but it's based on the definition and not the number of levels of the stack. But anyway, when a lambda expression reaches over and binds to a variable outside, that is called a closure. Why is it called a closure? Because this closes over a defining context. And say the word closes over several times, you probably end up with closure. So a closure is nothing but a lambda expression that closes over the defining context. Now, having said this, I want to say that while these are nice concepts out there, languages tend to take on certain affinity to certain terminologies. For example, if you look at Java, in Java, mostly people use the word lambdas. They rarely use the word closure. In the case of Groovy, they rarely use the word lambda. 
They use the word closure most of the time. So people kind of very jovially use these words, uh, you know, informally they use these words. But if you sit next to somebody who is very, you know, pedantic and they say, what do you mean it's a closure? It's not a closure, it's a lambda expression. And they get very angry with you. The best thing to do when you find people like that is quietly get up and walk away, right? There is absolutely no point in arguing with them. It doesn't really matter. As long as you know the difference, you don't have to really distinguish it most of the time. You can just use that liberally as closure versus lexical scoping. I'm sorry, closure versus lambda, which is perfectly fine. But one of the coolest things about lexical scoping is, or closures is, that it becomes a carrier of state. So you can create a little lambda expression here or a closure here, and it kind of floats away, and it's being used over here, and at this point, it can nicely transfer the state across. Go ahead, please. Correct. Yes, correct. Awesome. Yes, yeah. Have you, have you ever been in a movie where you are sitting there and biting your nail and the person next to you says, that's the brother of the killer. Thank you. <laughs> so, so the beauty of this is, so the beauty of this is, um, you're able to, I'm trying to dump that state so I can move on to this other state. Uh, carrying state. So you can create this beautiful object here, send it across, and have that object really use the state from all over here and nicely translates that over. So that's all great so far, but rethinking how we code makes a huge difference. So let's think about this for a second. How do you find a prime number? Now let's think about finding a prime number for a second, how we would go about doing this. So if you look at this example here, I want to start with something really, really simple. Let's say e is prime 1, and we know it is not. And I'm going to ask for a few different values, 2 over here, and then 3 and 4 and, and 5, let's say. right? So let's give it a try. So public static Boolean, and let's say e is prime, and we say int number, right? Given a number, what do we do with this number? That's what we want to do here. Okay, great. Now, now that we have this number on our hand, how would I go about writing this code? Well, we would say for int i equals to 2 i less than number, and then we would say i plus plus, and then we would say something along these lines, boolean uh, flag equals uh, false. Anybody who has written a flag before? Always, how do you feel? <laughs> I have a name for that. It, flag is called a smell, right? Every time you use a flag, you lose a level of confidence in yourself, right? That's how it feels to me at least, right? It's like, why? Why am I setting this flag? Then you come in here and then you say, if uh, I is, uh, I, I mod two, so number mod two is equal to zero, then what do you do? flag equals false, then it has to be true, right? Isn't that fun to be able to go back and forth? And then you can say if number is greater than or not equal to one or greater than one and flag, then what do you do? You return the true, so you would say return over here, right? So I don't know, maybe this code works. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. So it says false, true, true, false, true. Does it uh, seem like it is working? kind of in some definition of working, right? But the point is, that is a very sad code, isn't it? Because if somebody sits down and says, explain this to me, what are you going to say? You're going to say, keep quiet. I'm trying to figure that out myself, right? Because you got to go through and see if all the combinations are working. Well, shall we try to write this a little differently, shall we? So we'll be expressive this time. So what am I going to do? Return number is greater than 1 and and int stream dot range. Hey, that's interesting. What is that? Starting from two, not including number, and I'm going to simply say none match. 
and what is non-matching? Well, given an element, I want to know number uh, in this case, mod i is equal to zero, and none is matching that. That's what we are saying. Would you agree this code is more expressive? You read it, and you're like, it's no fun. I understand everything now. It's boring, right? I want the code to be very boring, right? That way, you're done, and you're not interested in you know, trying to stare at this code and try to figure out what's really going on. So we saw the imperative way to do it, but we also saw a functional way to do this as well. It's a lot better to easy to express it. So in other words, what am I getting to at this point? What I'm getting to at this point is, when you look at this code, did I set the flag properly? Have you ever had a time when you set the flag incorrectly and had to go fix it? Absolutely. And then when you write the code with the for loop, have you ever forgot to put a less than and less than equal to sometimes? Absolutely. And then one of my most favorite, have you ever went back to work and said, darn it, that's off by one error? Right? We all have done that, right? So in other words, when you look at the code below, it just tells you what you're doing. So here's the deal. I want the code to be like this. I want the code to read like a story, not like a puzzle. Right? So when you look at the code, it's like a story. You read it, I get it, it's wonderful. A puzzle, on the other hand, you're scratching your head. You're like, let me think about it through dinner. And then you come back next morning and say, I think I figured out, only to know that that's not right. And so you don't want it to be a puzzle. You want it to be a story. You want to figure it out very easily, and you want to work with it. And to me, that is very important, writing the code. So we saw how we can do this very nicely. So immutability and pure functions make functional programming. But at its heart, Functional programming is really not about mutability. It is really not about uh, you know, saying you can pass functions around. Sure, that's what makes a functional programming. However, as he rightly pointed out, and never go to a movie with him, so the point is that it is all about function composition, and it is really about how we can make use of this in lazy evaluation. So what is function composition and what is lazy evaluation? I want to talk about that a little bit further. Now, think about this for a second. Let's go to, uh, 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 well, let's think about for a minute Java for a second. So if I want to write something like this, uh, in Java, let me leave this here. So in Java, if I want to write uh, if, so I'm going to say int age equals some age. We'll come back to it. So I'm going to say something along the lines of string can vote, and I want to set some value for can vote. So I'm going to say, we'll come back to this also. And I want to say if age is greater than, uh, what's the voting age in this country? 18. So if it is greater than 18, I want to give the you know, OK for this person to vote. And otherwise, else, we're going to say something, right? Now, if I say this, complete that sentence for me. This is a if what? It's a if what? Statement. I want you to say the word statement. How do you feel? <laughs> you feel like something was taken away from you, right? Do you feel grim? Do you feel excited when I say statement? No, right? Now say the word expression. You see that? You feel it, don't you? You feel light. You're smiling already. Statement. Expression. What's the difference? A statement says, OK, statement, can you do this? Uh-huh. Did you finish it? Yes. What did you do? I won't tell you. By definition, what does a statement do? Forces mutability on you, right? That's why this is an if statement. You call the if, what does it say? I will cause damage. I will change stuff for you. So now you have to say, can vote equals yes. And then else, you say, can vote. And you can say, uh, what do you say here? Uh, you know, no, go home, kid, right? Whatever you want to say. Now you can see, this is mutation. And what do you start with over here? Null. How do you feel, right? Uh, null is pronounced as smell, right? That's what it really is. But why do we do this? Because if is a statement. Now, in a really good functional programming language, there are no statements. Think of the world with no statements. Wouldn't you? That's like Narnia, right? 
you come and it's like, oh, beautiful. It is all great weather all the time. And it's, it feels better, isn't it? So what if you have no statements at all? You only have expressions. Am I making sense? Then what happens? You can nicely compose through expressions, whereas statements kind of leave residue and leave you to go get stuff, right? Now, that is one thing you can do function composition. Let's look at function composition real quick with one example to appreciate that. So in here, I'm going to say, given a list of numbers. So let's say for a minute that I want to have a list of numbers. So list, and in this case, let's say integer. And I'm going to say in here, numbers equals arrays dot as list. Let's just say these values, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So I've got a lot of different numbers, but I'm going to change it to a 5, 4. Let's do it this way. Now, I want to find the a double of the first even number greater than, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 3. So shall we do this? int total uh, result equal to 0, and output at the end result. And I'm going to say for int element in numbers, and what should I do with these numbers now? I'm going to say if element is greater than 3 and element mod 2 is equal to 0, then result is equal to e times 2. So there you go my code to find the first even number greater than 3 and which is, yeah, even number greater than 3. Is this good? No, I heard. What's wrong? You need a break. Let's give you a break. Now is it good? Did you notice what just happened? You went from it is not good to I'm not sure. That is imperative code again. Imperative code is hiding to hurt you when you expect the least. In fact, if you write this code, about three months later, the tester is going to walk in and say, hey, I'm using your code, and I want you to know your code sucks. <laughs> Normally, what do you tell the tester? You say, I know it. Tell me how my code sucks. That's what I don't know, right? We always know our code sucks, but how does it suck is what we don't know. Well, we won't even know how this code sucks. We'll find out in a minute. Now I'm going to say output. Now I say numbers dot and stream dot filter, and what am I filtering? Given an element, element is greater than uh, 3, and given an element, element is even, and finally, so e mod 2 is equal to 0, and finally, I want to say map, given an element, element times 2, and find first. Now notice this code for a second. If I run this code, it didn't give us an 8. It gave us an optional 8. Why? Now you know why the code sucked in the first place. Because the list is empty. Or there are no even numbers. There are no number greater than 3. For all those, what was the result in the previous case? A 0. Is that right? Not really. It should have been, we don't have an answer. But it gave us a wrong answer. Well, of course, when you show that to Java programmers, they immediately say, oh, I can fix it. How do you fix it? Oh, very simple. You would change that to integer, and you would say in here, null. Now, the solution is worse than the problem, isn't it? Whereas in this case, notice how the code nicely reads and stacks up. It begins to read like the problem statement. Make sense? So that is function composition. But this function composition may result in a poor performance unless we have another feature which is extremely important, which is called lazy evaluation. I'm going to show you a little introduction to what a lazy evaluation feels like, and then I'll come back and complete this example to show another example and finish it up. So let's look at a, a lazy evaluation. Uh, I'm going to write code here uh, just for the fun of it. I'm going to say, here is a function called, let's say, say hello to kid equals print line. And I'm going to say, uh, what do I say here? Uh, let's say uh, hello. Uh, kiddo, right? So I want to call this. So in this case, I'm going to say, say hello to kiddo, a uh, kid, and you can see that it says, hello, kiddo. This is Haskell code. Just for the fun of it, let's play with it. So it says, hello, and it said that. Great. Now let's write one more function, can we? I'm going to say, say hello to adult, and in this case, I'm going to say, uh, howdy, right? And that's an adult. So let's go ahead and say, say hello to adult. And you can see it says howdy. 
Now I can call both of those just for the fun of it. You can see that it said, hello, kiddo, and hello, howdy, right? However, let's not do that for a second. Let's come back and say, greet, and I'm going to say 30, and I'm going to say, say hello to adult, and say hello to kid. Just look at that for a second. Let's take that as just a quick example into Java, C++, C Sharp, whatever language we are familiar with. Think about it like it's a code in that one of those languages. So technically, it would look something like this, isn't it? So it would be calling these functions. Now here, notice the syntax. It is calling the function we call here. That's exactly what it looks like here, too. However, there is a beauty hidden in here. If you notice in this particular example, if you look at this, you would say, oh, yeah, you know, evaluate this, evaluate this, and pass the result to greet. But that's not exactly how functional programming languages often work. So if you go back to this example, well, notice we called the say hello kid. We called the say hello adult. But now we are just passing those two functions over there. So if I say greet, and age comma, message to kid, and message to adult, the other way around, message to adult, and message to kid. Now, um, adult, now notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to say if age is greater than 18, then message to adult, else message to kid. So if I run this code, notice it only said howdy. It did not say hello, kiddo. Why not? because it's lazy evaluation. So it doesn't really evaluate the function here. It simply passes the function and says, you evaluated. If instead of 30, if I pass 3 over here, notice it says, hello, kiddo, and not hello, uh, howdy. So you can see the uh, laziness being called over here, right? In other words, it doesn't eagerly evaluate the function. It passes the function and says, here you go, take the function, call it if you like. I don't care if you don't call it. That is called lazy evaluation. Now, the word lazy is pronounced a little differently in functional programming. You uh, pronounce it as efficient, right? So the laziness gives you efficiency. This is, I mean, don't try to use this at work tomorrow. Why are you so lazy? Because I'm efficient, right? Well, this gives you the efficiency in this case. Now, as a result, let's see what we can do. Find the first prime number. Let's go back and look at this for a second and see how we're going to use this one. So I got the function called is prime with us, so don't worry about it. Let's come back and do something else with this. So I'm going to say in here, um, over, let's call this as find the um, find the first prime number greater than 100, uh, where it is uh, uh, where its square root is greater than 20. So not the first prime number. I'm going to say uh, find the first uh, let's say 100 prime numbers. How about that? Right, uh, greater than 100, where its uh, square root is greater than uh, 20. Um, so if you were to do this. How would you write this code in a functional style of code, right? Well, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say stream.iterate, given one, give me a, given an element, give me the next element. I want you to stare at this for a minute, just this code for a minute. So what does this do? This is called an infinite stream. Now think about it for a minute. It's an infinite stream. What does that mean? You can start with one. And then it gives you two, three, four, five. How much time do we have? Six, seven. And it keeps on going. You may say, really? It's infinite? Absolutely. How would you store this? On the cloud, of course, right? <laughs> no. So the beauty of this is it is infinite stream, but it says, I dare you. You want to have the infinite? You can have it. You're like, well, I don't have space to store it. So how much would you like? How, why don't you give me about 20? It really makes it on demand. That is the beauty of infinite collections. So notice what I can do. I got this infinite collection. What am I going to do now? I'm going to say dot filter. Remember filter? And what am I going to say? Given an element, I want to say sample colon colon is prime. So I'm asking him to give only the prime numbers, right? That's all I did. So it gives us only the prime numbers. And at this point where I have the dot, is it still an infinite collection? Absolutely, except it's an infinite collection of primes rather than an infinite collection of all the numbers. Isn't that pretty cool? It feels like awesome, isn't it? 
You're like, I have an infinite collection here. Can I see it? No, right? Not yet. This is why. Why is it? Why, why can't I see it? Use one word. Lazy, absolutely, right? So the real beauty is in combining com composition and laziness, please. It is empty. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, you. E plus one. Hey, E plus E is even better. Yeah, E plus one. You're right, absolutely. Thanks for debugging that. Hey, I love paid programming. You see that? All right. So now, is that good now? Infinite prime collection. How much do you want here? Well, I want to find a mapping, and where do I a filter again? And what's the filter? Given an element, now in this case, elements are prime, isn't it? Math.square root of the element is greater than 20. Isn't that what he said? Yes? Dot limit 100. Dot collect to list. So all that done, what does this really do? Well, I need a collectors, so I'll bring in a collectors. So I'm going to say collectors dot to list, and it's a static import I'm going to bring in. These are language specific, so don't get too excited about it. So that's all we did so far is we're running through that. So this is going to be the collectors on the stream. Let's fix that. This is collectors with the uppercase C. There we go. So we got all the collection of values, and what do I want to do? I want to store this into a result. So list integer will say integer, and we will say uh, result equals for a minute. So now that we have stored it into a result, what do I want to do with this? Now I'm going to say, uh, just for the fun of it, result.size. How much do you expect this to be? 100, you said, all right. And then result dot, let's say get one, or zero rather, the very first one. What's the first one? 401, it says. Well, because remember you said the uh, square root is greater than 20. And I want to know what's the last one. If you're curious about the last one, I can get the last one as well. And that seems to be that value. But the beauty of this is, would you agree this code is very highly expressive? But what do you see in play here? You see two things in play. What are the two things? Laziness is one. What's the other one? Composition, as he pointed out, right? So the real charm is in being lazy and composing functions together, isn't it? Now, where do you go from here? This is where I think reactive programming starts. In reactive programming, you are composing laziness with function composition, and you're trying to create a very highly responsive applications. When I was looking at reactive programming, I screamed out saying, oh boy, this is really functional programming plus plus, because it seems to logically take, where fr take off from where functional programming has left us. So to me, this is where the real charm is, is in the functional programming is, in effectively using laziness and putting together laziness in combination with the function composition. What, the, what does this mean? What it means is, as we start to write programs, as we start to write applications, we got to think more in declarative style. Come with a better abstraction. Use functions and pass functions around. Avoid mutability as much as you can, because it becomes more expressive, less error prone, easier to reason. And when we start doing all of that, now we got the infrastructure to benefit from the next level, which is nicely putting together function composition and being lazy. And I hope you found this very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could, I, could, I, could I say one more word, if you don't mind? Which one? I, 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 uh, I, wanna, I did not know this, but I came to know this is the first time the conference has been organized. I want to say how wonderfully it's been organized. I, want, I had an absolute fantastic time. I hope you did too. I think the organizers require a big applause. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.